Here we go. So good afternoon, everybody from, uh, from Sydney, and welcome to this very special Chateau Tananda tasting event. Zooming from the rocks in Sydney at Chateau Tananda's new specialist store, and of course in uh, Chateau Tananda in the Barossa Valley, um, which has just experienced a, a massive storm with a lot of hail. So you're going to hear a lot of stories about that over the next uh, few days. Um, my name is uh, Andrew Kayard, and with me is Michelle Gieber, who is the managing director of Chateau Tananda and represents the second generation custodian. Um, and, um, and behind the scenes, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge all the Chateau Tananda staff, and I know there are a lot of them um, on, this, uh, on this Zoom meeting looking at the 2021 collection, so it's fantastic. Really enthusiastic group of people. I'd like to thank Justin, Celine, and uh, Ian and, uh, for helping putting this uh, whole thing together today. Um, it's great to see John Gieber down there in Shadow Tanunda. I've known him for, a, oh, I don't know, it must be about 30 years at least before he even really got into, into fine wine anyway. And, uh, and I've been always quite fascinated about what he's been doing. And, uh, you know, the Shadow Shadow Tanunda. Um, investment and development over the last 20 years has been nothing short of extraordinary. And uh, in having being a historian and knowing so much about so many entrepreneurs in uh, the Australian wine industry over, over the last uh, 200 years, you know, he's very much following in the path of Sir Samuel Davenport, um, Benno Seppel, John Pinney Bear from Shadow to Nanda, uh, so, um, from uh, Shadow to Bilk. Uh, Thomas Highland from Penfolds, Peter Bond Borgogna, all those type of characters, which is, uh, you know, quite a quite a um, an honor roll of uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurs with huge visions. Um, so absolutely um, fascinating. And so Shadow Tananda is a really grand vision, and uh, I've really kind of found um, the wine quality improving over the years, and I think he's really kind of. Um, resurrected this uh, chateau into something really quite um, magnificent. Uh, I've also got a very personal interest in Chateau Tananda because as I've been researching on the history of Australian wine, I found out that my, my great grandfather, Walter Rennell, was actually the superintending uh, director of Chateau Tananda in the very early 1900s. And so uh, it's kind of quite neat that I'm here kind of um, presenting Chateau Tananda, um, you know, how history repeats itself. Um, Michelle Aguiba, um, who's here to my right, is very much part of this uh, modern renaissance and is steering uh, the business in this post-China, um, post-COVID world. And uh, she's really the ideal person to take uh, the business to its high altitude stage. Uh, she's actually been the managing director of uh, Shatterton Under for about six years and uh, has already done an enormous amount of things to add shine and polish to this Shadow Tananda name. And I think this boutique store here really kind of epitomizes the, the ambitions and the prestige marketing that's, uh, that's behind the Shadow Tananda name. And in fact, Michelle, this, this place really reminds me of a, of a Bordeaux store. You know, this is the kind of thing we haven't really seen uh, uh, in Australia in, in any you know, kind of major way anyway. And it just kind of really smells the tradition and being down the rocks, you know, very much a part of the 19th century. I know it started in the 18th century in 1788, but very much a part of the 19th century tradition at Orange. And yet the, the ambiance of this place is so modern and understated luxury. Um, this tasting in many ways reflects this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, yeah. Andrew. It's a real pleasure to be here. Andrew, uh, a pleasure and an Thank honor you. to have you here today with your incredible depth um, and knowledge of wines from around the, around the world and Australia, a master of wine. And as we've just heard, a lot of um, a life's plight in understanding the history of Australian wine as well. So thank you so much. Um, we are here today in our new location at The Rocks in Sydney, our Chateau Tanunda Sydney cellar door. Um, what an incredible rich history of this precinct here. We have 130, over 130 years of history at Chateau Tanunda. So it seems very fitting that we're able to, for the first time, invite people into our intimate space here for private hosted taste tastings of our luxury wines uh, and bring a little bit of the Barossa to Sydney. So please, um, we'd love to have you stop by, come and check us out. Um, we are open and ready to tell you all about our 2021 collection here at, at the Rock Cellar Door. So 
The 2021 collection is all about the new vintage releases of our limited edition wines, handcrafted from optimal vineyards, selected in the Barossa, chosen and sought out over time for their exceptional fruit character. Our vision and continued plight here at Shadow Tanunda is to, to take what the entrepreneurial founders that we've spoken a little bit about today um, started and continue on this passion. Um, this is all about handcrafted, distinctive, significant wines from our famous wine region, the Barossa, and the pursuit of excellence. Um, to bring these wines to the world and to our Australian audiences. And I know that we have some people from around the world here today. We've got as far as the UK and Europe um, and all around Australia. So it is quite a, an, an intimate session um, in terms of who's on the link today tasting the wines alongside with us. If anyone has any questions, please do feel free to write it in the chat box and we will we'll endeavour to answer any um, um, any questions that you have. And so we've spoken, Neville Rowe, our chief winemaker, we're uh, very excited to have you on board. Your skill and passion um, and expertise really bring our wines to life. Um, and we are so thankful for your dedication. Um, your dedication to excellence is apparent and I can't wait to hear more stories about the wine as we, as we go on today. John Geber, my father, we've already said the word passion many times, all about passionate shadow to under and John really brings that in spades. So you will be sharing a lot of the, the stories, particularly of the old vine expressions and the thought process behind why we have chosen these particular wines uh, to, bring, to bring them to life as, as history and reflections of the best that the Barossa has to offer. Yeah, so John, you might like to talk about uh, a little bit about your your kind of uh, old vine expressions and and the way that you kind of structured your 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 wine um, your wines. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome back to the chateau, uh, Andrew. So very nice to hear your introduction and everybody out there. I, I I have a very soft spot for Andrew, but I'm very jealous of him. He doesn't know because 30 years ago I did have hair. He's kept his head. Yeah, that's right. The other thing is, we are closed down in uh, Sydney, and yeah. Neville and I in the Barossa, us guys from uh, South Australia can't get into Sydney without getting, we can't get back uh, for the time being. So our cellar door opened on July 3rd, was closed down four hours later. So Andrew and Michelle, you in this great dream of ours, Shatter to under cellar door on the rocks, which our very first distributors, Tuckers, actually had an office just around the corner. So it's funny how history repeats itself and Andrew's great granddad being there. This brings us to where we are. We are 131 years old. Uh, Michelle and I are custodians together with all our staff of this wonderful building. Um, I felt, and Andrew and I have traveled so extensively and spoken, that there is something absolutely special about old vine expressions and the Barossa epitomizes this better than anybody other wine region I can think of. So when we look at the concept of a 50 year old group of vines, 100 year old and 150, we are actually putting a foot in each of the three past centuries, of which the shadow's been around for. We also encouraging particularly our foreign guys, uh, foreigners who drink our wine, that you're not only drinking an exceptional wine uh, made by my friend here on the left, Neville, who this year is in the top 100 uh, winemakers, master winemakers by Drinks Business Worldwide. There were seven Australians in there, well done Neville. John. But bringing that through is not only ex expression of exceptional wine making, it's an expression of the earth, of what we can do. These vines of all of them have been pre phylloxera or most of them. And the 50 year olds are really straight in there on their own roots as well, not on rootstock. It just does generate something deeper and better, um, not as voluminous, but you know, high in quality. So I felt very, very uh, fascinated by this because it's a, it's a point of difference versus everywhere else in the world and the Barossa has it in spades. So for example, Andrew, the Semillon that we're gonna get into now is a favorite of mine, it's 150 year old. So there's 3.75 hectares out of 120,000 hectares in the Barossa, 3.75 of which one of our vineyards has about a half a hectare. 
So I'm extremely proud of that. It just shows you the rarity. So when we start talking about that wine, think of that. Same with the 100 year old. Out of this whole Barossa, nearly 12,000 hectares, there are 100 hectares of vines over 100 years old. So I'm fascinated with that, absolutely. On the 150 year old field blend, which we're gonna to have today or not, uh, just to speak about it, very, very rare. Um, that we believe is one of the oldest field blends in the world. That's uh, Grenache, Mervedra, a little bit of Shiraz, and of course some Malbec in there. That Malbec, as far as we understand, must be one of the oldest Malbecs in the world. So our uh, Argentinian friends, uh, lovely to have your company, but this is amongst the oldest that we can think of. So this is something very, very special and something all of us in Australia should be very proud of. So you're not only drinking exceptional wines made by this guy um, and put a lot of heart into it, we're drinking the providence, the authenticity, and the history of the Barossa Valley. Yeah, that's a pretty good uh, summation of, uh, of the Barossa Valley. I mean, I've known the place for a very, very long time and it's got a beautiful history. And I think those uh, old vines also represent generations of effort and ambition. And, uh, you know, they were really huge ambitions for the Barossa and the early settlers. And it's really, really very, very moving. Um, this 150 year old Semior really comes from one of the oldest surviving vineyards in, in, in the Barossa. And as you quite rightly say, you know, it may get, it's quite unique in the sense that, you know, there are quite a lot of hectareage of very, very old uh, Shiraz vines, Grenache, uh, Mataro, I like to call it Mataro rather than Morvedra because that's what everyone else used to call it in the 19th century. But uh, there are very, very few um, wines um, in the world that are made from 150 year old Semillon. And so I think this makes this wine rare, really um, uh, fascinating from a story point of view and a kind of feeling that when you're drinking it, that you're drinking something extraordinary. And, and it's for that reason why I really love the wine. And, you know, it's really beautifully concentrating and it concentrated and it has this really lovely underlying talk, um, which gives it a bit of a grunt on the palate and, and, and takes the flavors across. And, and then it finishes with a slight phenolic twist. And I really like those, the, those elements into the, into the Semillon because they really give, um, they really give freshness. Uh, against the richness and the, uh, 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 of the wine itself. Uh, very different to the Hunter Valley style, uh, which are particularly low alcohol and, and can be very skinny and tight when they're young and, and take a long time to really unfold. Whereas this wine is really just so delicious to drink right now, Neville. What do you think? Can you tell me about uh, it? A, a good summary. Thank you, Andrew. And, you know, with uh, thank you for the accolades, John, as well. Um, with these old vineyards that we are so lucky to be able to have uh, as a fruit source for the wines, you know, it, there's a lot of truth to the to the the saying that vineyards, great wines are made in a vineyard, and it's very true for all of these wines, and none less than the the Semillon. Um, and I like the word talk about this wine and that slight phenolic feel, and I'll get to that in a second. The the vineyard here is um, in the in the heart of the of the floor of the Barossa Valley and the we have to think that 150 years ago in the burgeoning uh, food bowl of the Barossa Valley we were planting vines in the right spots where it was uh, uh, easy for the vines to grow it was before irrigation and these sorts of things so uh, this is these vines exist that long because they're in a very suitable spot for, for their growth. The wine has got um, the aromatics of that uh, grapefruit pith which I, I relate to this particularly the Madeira clone uh, of which this is. The Madeira clone, the, the, the outer berries turn a lovely copper russet color uh, toward the uh, ripening period. And whilst it's still quite uh, crisp and fresh, uh, th these are wines that will live. They certainly, as Andrew said, deliver more volume of flavor and, and, and just more texture as, a, as young wines. And, and that the texture and the way that that sort of little phenolic crispness uh, helps to balance the wine, gives it you know, a lot of uh, food suitability as well. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a Barossan style of Semillon, can be nowhere else in the world. And Semillon's really one of the great Australian wines that you can sell for a long time. Um, this wine here is, I think, in incredibly um, $60, um, which given the history and the way that the wines are made, fermented in oak, time in oak, um, is absolutely incredible to taste such a unique part 
of Barossa history of, you know, some of the most exciting white wine ageability um, wines of Australia at, at this price. Yeah, and I think there's just so much of a talking point about it. And it's interesting you're talking about the Madeira clone as well, because of course, uh, Madeira is not known for having Semillon and, and it's not called Madeira clone because it comes from Madeira. It was actually because it was uh, called Madeira by the by the growers was there had been a mix up or something along the line and then and then eventually they identify it as as uh, as Semillon. So it's heritage vine stock material that has come into South Australia very, very early on, um, you know, probably in the in the very early 1840s. So it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, this, there is very, very few wines in Australia that have this type of, uh, of old vine provenance and I think that's what makes it interesting and at $60 a bottle I think it's pretty fair but it's also a kind of style that people, there are some people who don't like Semillon because they're too because they they, they they're quite acidic mm -hmm. and and uh, they don't have the volume particularly mm -hmm. when they're young but this has it so you know if you like if you like um, you know kind of Chardonnay for instance this is the kind of wine that uh, that Chardonnay drinkers will really love. And I certainly think it's a, a very fine semillon. I really loved it. Now, the next wine we'd, we'd just talk about in two pairs. The first one is the Eden Valley and, and the other one from the Ebenezer, which is from the Barossa floor. And I think these are really interesting because, you know, first of all, this idea of terroirs and, you know, it's a, it's a word that's very French. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly, you know, in, in the Barossa, they've been using words uh, like the Barossa grounds, you know, to try and identify the sub-regional characters of the Barossa. And over the over course of, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years, you know, I've kind of been tasting and, you know, looking at all these things. And you start seeing, you know, uh, slightly differences between these particular sub-regions. But they're very difficult to, to describe sub-regions because, uh, um, you know, a lot of names of places have been taken up by wine producers and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, in the end, it's quite difficult to really, you know, kind of formalize, you know, what the terroirs are. But everyone who's in the Barossa knows precisely the type of characters that you're going to get in those particular parts of the world. But just in a very, very simple way, um, the choice of these ones is to show you the difference between Barossa floor fruit, which, uh, um, which is, uh, you know, kind of a slightly warmer uh, kind of growing uh, season, you know, against the Eden Valley, which is a bit more altitude, different types of soils. And they have a very different type of profile. So uh, typically, you know, if you look at these two terroir, um, terroirs of the Barossa Shirazes together, you'll see that there is uh, a similarity because of course you've got uh, a winemaker who's basically dealing with the wine in a very, very similar way, a bit like a signature, a house style. But at the same token, you've got the natural characteristics of these, each of these places coming through. And uh, so for instance, with Eden Valley, you're beginning to see these kind of um, on top of the, of the, of the Shiraz, um, you know, dark fruit, choco berry type of notes. You're seeing the, the slight herb garden, sage aromatics, and the tannins are just a little bit more crisper uh, with that al, al dente, um, al dente type of texture, the kind of spaghetti-like al dente texture. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of wine writers take piss because, uh, out of me because of using that word, but I love that description <laughs> for for tannin because I, I love that um, that 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 character in in a wine. It's absolutely brilliant. So then when you compare to the to the Barossa floor with the Ebenezer, you'll find, of course, the red and, and black fruits, but you find the the, the, the tannins are a bit uh, a little bit looser knit and uh, and chocolatey and and you know I absolutely love that that style. You know, they these are the type of wines that um, that uh, Australians particularly uh, gravitate to it because they're just so delicious and warm to drink. Neville, do you want to give a comment about those two wines? Yes, happy to. The, the I, I'm I'm with you on al dente, and you know perhaps the um, the Barossa floor. The pasta has just cooked for another sixty seconds, and, yeah. and you have a little little more softness, so yeah. um, uh, and plushness, I think, to them. Um, you're right. The, the Eden Valley. Uh, these wines are made uh, essentially where we try to back the wine making influence out of the wine, and and make sure the fruit is is speaking most loudly. Um, Eden Valley has uh, that sort of uh, uh, blue ink and, and uh, a sort of red licorice characters that uh, 
uh, and, and a hint of violet. Um, and I love that into that third sage and uh, herb spectrum of flavors. Um, their tannins are um, a little more firm and, you know, perhaps uh, um, you know, reflect that cool climate uh, that much more. The plushness of, of Barossa Valley floor comes really through in, in the Ebenezer and, and, and perhaps the, the, the ripeness of fruit and the power of, of, the, of the weight of the wine, you know, that's a, a very forthright uh, sort of wine, I think, and and really stands its ground um, four square. Um, it's not a um, it doesn't it's not an apologetic wine in any in any way. Um, it's good to see these two side by side because you are talking about um, the two great aspects of the of the Barossa Valley, the cooler, higher Eden Valley, which is only three hundred meters really above sea level, above the Barossa floor, but it makes a world of difference. There's more moisture. Um, and it's the sort of place that in a cool, wet year, you know, Cabernet will almost not ripen, um, whereas the Brossa floor is, um, gets moisture from the runoff of those hills, but it is uh, warmer and, and, and subsequently more power. And I've, I've I plagiarised this from another winemaker, but it's the yin and the yang of the Barossa Valley, the two things that balance each other. You have the power uh, from the floor and the grace from the from the Eden Valley, and here you have them in their own right, in quite complete wines in their own. You know, they they're they're, they're very interesting drinks. You know, uh, uh, under their own right, so uh, fascinating sort of, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to offer people to to see that terroir influence. And I think, Andrew, what I love about this, there are 16, to our good friends out there, there's 16 different soil types in the Barossa. And we've been playing this with terroirs of the Barossa. Of course, everybody down here calls it the terrors of the Barossa, <laughs> uh, which I find quite amusing because there yeah. are 16 different soils. So we've got, the terror the we've got four, you the terror. <laughs> <laughs> but what I do find so interesting in this is that, you know, our wines out of the, uh, the terrors of the Barossa. Uh, the Barossa will always be a heavyweight boxer. You can be Mike Tyson or George Foreman. We, and what Neville does is he makes elegant wines. We are Muhammad Ali. After the eighth round, we're winking at the lady with the number eight thing. We knock the guy out. And what I love about these two wines is the Ebenezer, which is in the northern part, is a, um, you know, it's again a full Barossa. And then we go up to the Eden Valley where it's a little tighter, sort of Shiraz that I love very much. It's not overwhelming. And it's just wonderful to see terror, or the terror's expression coming out in these wines. A concept we latched onto about uh, 15 years ago, and it's been remarkably successful. And a lot of people come down and will buy, buy, buy all four and taste them next to each other. And it's a great, again, another little edge. Everybody can do Shiraz. Can you do the terrors of the Barossa? No, you can't. We can. <laughs> And I think that easily um, one of the secret uh, terroirs of the Barossa of what Chateau Tunanda, we've been doing this, as you mentioned, John, for uh, over a decade, this exploration on the sub-regional characteristics. And um, we're only just opening this up to the wider market where you used to have to come to the cellar door to explore these different sub-regional characters. It's, it's really our opportunity as a, as a winery to be able to explore with you, explore with the people drinking our wines, the unique differences of terroir in a really representative way. We get to do it when we're doing our, um, you know, tasting through our, our, our vintage classifications and, um, you know, we know where the different vineyards are that are coming in in, in our small batch fermentation in um, at Shadow Tanunda, but this is our opportunity to really share that exploration with you. So, um, Michelle so Mitchell has just advised me. It's uh, we've been doing it for 16 years, man. I'm getting old, but I, I love it. 16 years, and it's funny. It's taken that time just for people the reputation to get around. I was in Brisbane last weekend. Uh, somebody said to me, "Oh, your terroirs, terrors of the Barossa." I find it the most fascinating concept, and this is. Uh, not a freaky wine drinker, just a, a wine drinker who just appreciates great wine. 
Moving on. Now. Yeah, I think I think also it's a part of uh, the Barossa coming to age as well. Um, you know, people have been talking about sub-regional difference for 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 a long time. Uh, when we ever whenever you go and visit Bordeaux, you always talk about Margot and Poyac and Saint Julien and Saint Saint Estep and everything. And that is a natural kind of progress for the Barossa as as winemakers start you know looking at their individual sites and stuff like that. It's not that long ago when winemakers said you couldn't make uh, single vineyard wines. Um, notwithstanding the very well-known one up in the Eden Valley, that you couldn't really make single vineyard wine. So it's, it, you know, it's just about what's happening is evolution. And uh, Shadow Tanon is certainly at, uh, at the forefront of that evolution, which is really exciting. Well, I, I might yeah. just call out, we've yeah. got a couple of comments and oh, then yeah. we'll move on to the, the 50 year olds and the 100 year olds. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll grab the yeah. comments. Brendan, thank you so yeah. much, saying that he feels the Eden Valley really has incredible length. Right. And I know that we've got Matt yeah. from Newcastle. Hello, welcome to Hi, the Matt. tasting. Thanks for joining us. He's just got a question back on the semion and the residual sugar. Um, Neville, he says it's quite dry, it's quite dry, but beautiful, full and round and zero residual sugar. I think the thing about whites from Shadow Tanana, we're in a red region, the Barossa. If we're going to get up and do a white wine, you know, it's going to be very special. Uh, so let us now move on to the rest of the old vine expression, yeah. exploration in the in the reds yeah no definitely um and really where we're coming to now with uh 50 year old vines you're really you're really starting you know to see some really good density and uh richness and concentration in the wines i mean the cat barossa is actually one of the you know kind of early places where cabernet sauvignon was um was planted and in fact it has some of the oldest surviving pre phylloxera vines uh in the world in the barossa um, it first came into South Australia probably in the 1840s, first came into Australia in 1837. But uh, Cabernet is not really normally associated with the Barossa, yet um, some of the best Cabernets uh, in, the in, in Australia do come from the Barossa. And uh, it's really great to, to, um, to see this very expressive uh, Cabernet. It's really got abundant dark fruits fine grainy graphite textures. And I really like the power and vigor on this. And it's a really nice, you know, kind of um, foil against the, the classic 50 year old vine um, Shiraz, which is, you know, really when you taste it, it's pretty much as classic as you can get, you know, with its, uh, I love the word choco berry, you know, um, the dark chocolate, dark berry, uh, aromatics and flavors, the density and the loose knit chalky chocolatey, um, you know, kind of textures, you know, I think, I think um, if, you, if, you, if you want to imagine um, Barossa Shiraz and you whack that in your, um, whack that uh, under your nose, you would say, well, that's, that's Barossa Shiraz. Um, Neville? Uh, <laughs> yes, I suppose um, we've got the Cabernet, uh, and the 50 year old Cabernet and the 50 year old Shiraz, the, uh, and they meant to typify what both of those varieties do in this region. Uh, you know, something to address here very briefly is, you know, does what does vine age confer to a wine? Does it make any difference? Is it is it a better wine because it's from an older vine? And there is there is argument, of course, ask two winemakers for their opinion. You'll get three opinions. Um, the uh, what I see and, and we're fortunate enough to have you know, over 50 year old vine Cabernet is, is really rare. Um, there really wasn't much Cabernet planted until the 60s and 70s. And so this is kind of some of the early stuff that was, uh, and it comes from our little vineyard uh, right next to the Chateau um, in the Bethany region, which is a little uh, gentler place. And it does help the Cabernet to retain uh, mm -hmm. some of those black currant and those uh, chalk and, and after dinner mint sort of characters, which uh, dark chocolate, which I, I love to see in the wine. And there is a tannin profile in here. The, the flavors are, are, are necessarily Barossan and, and Australian, um, but I, there's a graduation of tannin in this wine that I really try to uh, have a flow across the palate and, and uh, those tannins move from stages uh, to, to growing to the sort of finishing uh, more uh, um, uh, grippy long Cabernet tannins. And that's, you know, Good Cabernet, doesn't matter where it's grown in the world, even from that place in France, um, has that sort of flow of tannin. And I, I, you can see hallmarks of, of that variety there. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the critical point of, the, you know, kind of claret style is the, ta the tannin, the length of the tannin, I think you're right. 
Yeah, and uh, and I I love those wines, and in fact they're great wines to to make and to work on in ferment and to work in the blending bench because you can really structure that uh, the, that graduation across the palate. Um, it, they're exciting wines to make. The 50-year-old vine Shiraz where, is where you, in, in the growth habit of Shiraz is actually where you see the vine age starting to reflect on the wine because they've, they've been through their adolescent period. They're, they're, they're not growing oceans of uh, foliage and, and setting big crops. They're more balanced and they're in a more mature phase of their life and they're developing, they're more in tune with the ability of the, of the, of the site around them, the geology, the geography, uh, the moisture in their climate around them. And so they produce more balanced fruit. And you, you, in a hot year, you walk into a vineyard of old vines and the vines look happier than a, a vineyard of younger vines. They've just got bigger root systems, they can hang on a little more and they're more balanced in their environment. And I think that balance comes through in the wine. Um, and the 50 year olds are still, you know, that they're, they're in the prime of their, uh, their facilities and they're, they're powering ahead. And I, I don't, I like to make the 50 year old, it, it stands out as being quite a powerful wine. And uh, so there are some, there are some muscles in, to, to this Barossa and 50 year old vine Shiraz. Yeah, I'm just going back to your thing about plantings of, uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, yes, that most of the plantings did uh, go from the 60s and 70s. But the, the point really should be is, is that there were much earlier plantings and, and uh, really to take advantage of, um, the, of the, the boom in exports to um, the United Kingdom and other Commonwealth uh, or the Empire uh, kind of countries. And so, so although there might have been earlier plantings, but the, 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 the oldest surviving plantings uh, in the Barossa Valley go back to 1888. Yep. So, you know, it, there is a, a pretty nice. long tradition of that. Mm -hmm. um, the next wine um, we're going to look at is the 100-year-old wine Shiraz. And, you know, really this is just going up a notch. And, you know, for, for some people who drink these wines who are not used to drinking, might not see necessarily a massive uh, step up from the 50-year-old to the 100-year-old. But for me, um, you're really going into a level of classicism um, and beauty that uh, I always just find phenomenal, you know. I don't know, I, whenever you feel is when you're tasting these really old wines, you really can't become, you know, kind of, uh, I shouldn't say nostalgic, but really kind of think about, you know, about, you know, where we came from and where we are now and all those things. But, uh, you know, the, a really great Barossa Shiraz for me is something that's got really a lot of density and richness and has that beautiful mid palate viscosity. But, they, but the, the, the underlying theme that I think makes great uh, Shiraz is, is the freshness. And the freshness is, is, is absolutely key um, to a great example. And I think this is, Neville? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andrew. That's... Um bang on really for a description of the wine and it isn't necessarily from the 50 year old going uh, a simplistic view might say we're just going up in levels of concentration with age that's not in fact what happens uh, and it's not what happens to the wines they present themselves the the 100 year old is um, perhaps even just because it is com more complete as a wine uh, even at an early stage uh, there is a, a, a lovely complexity and a depth and a layering to this wine, which is the alluring part that brings you back to this wine more often. And I think if you can't taste a wine that's made from vines that are 100 years or older, and this is probably 120 years old if we, if we averaged it out, um, and feel as though you're not drinking a little slice back in time, and if the nostalgia bug doesn't kick into you, then it's probably time for a heart check. Um, and I, I love that uh, sort of PT complexity to this wine. Um, you know, there's, there, there's a suppleness to the palate and a, a sort of svelte plush tannin yeah. profile. The, the, the 50 year old has, the tannins are a, a little more present and a little more uh, uncoated. Whereas here, there, there's a, there's a, a flow and a, and a plushness and, a, and, a, and a, just a lovely viscosity to, the, to that. To the way the wine moves across the palate. Um, and that's really coming from some of those vines. The vines come from uh, uh, some couple of little tiny vineyards, um, one right in Nuripa, uh, one on the way to Makulta, um, and, and one here in just on the uh, beginning of the hillside um, and the, and the, on the Vine Vale region. And it's, uh, 
these are all kind of nice, uh, you know, those vines are very happy where they are. Uh, and they, and year to year, they exist, you know, they, they produce very consistent crops, very consistent flavors. And you see that in that one. So Andrew, you know, I, I love some of your classical expressions. So I always like to associate wines with people like <laughs> Shiraz Muhammad Ali versus George yeah. Foreman and those guys. But to me, this is a classic uh, Sophia Long. Oh She's God. now aged on. <laughs> she is still very beautiful. If you go back and look at her genesis and where she's come from, that beauty radiated all through and just became more and more elegant in time. And that's where we are with this wine. I often think of that like it. It's, uh, you say the step up isn't as much. I believe it is because Sophia Lauren is still a beautiful looking woman. I haven't seen her, but she's, I believe so. And this is a beautiful looking wine. Um, not as vivacious, but certainly there, that, that lineage is, is there. What I love about the wine here, guys, there are 700 dozen of these made. Every single one of them is numbered on the bottle. And that's something special to us, as we do with a 50 and 100 year old. And what number are we doing there, Mitch? 8313. 8313. And um, it's something special to the Chateau. We look at a authenticity and a heritage that should be documented and held. Um, the wines, as I said, of the 12,000 hectares in the Barossa, there are 100 hectares of vines over 100 years old. So less than 1%. Um, I love it that our company is part of its old nine expressions, treasures this, pushes it up, and makes people believe in it. And we'd love to share these opportunities with you. And I just find it so fascinating. We've gone through these, the 50 year olds. Nobody bought from my Sophia Lauren. I thought no, that was yeah. beautiful. I love that age, <laughs> that age uh, matures elegantly. And I it's, really hope it's, that it's something of a feminist. Like I was, that I was in my ready life. to shut him down. Beautiful. I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> so, we, we, um, so, fascinating here is that um, you've got the 50 year olds from, the, from our single vineyard with Shiraz and Cabernet side by side. And you've got the expression of, of that vineyard, the sandy loams, um, in death being one of the original settlements of the um, settled villages of the Barossa Valley in fact and you can you know basically throw a cricket ball at the vineyard from the from the chateau and but then you've got this 100 year old and you know we've actually been able to find three um, three vineyards of 100 year old vines and so not only getting the the, the depth and condensed fruit nature of a 100 year old vine in, in the wine, you're also getting the depth of some slightly different terroirs around the region to create something that is just um, so magnificent and a real exploration depth of flavor. flavor. And, and to me, I think as you taste through the wines, there's a there's a real, there's a house style. It's it's present in the silkiness of the vine, um, of the wines that we are tasting, uh, the elegance and plush, um, you know, vibrancy of using minimal minimal fruit um, handling that we, you know, is is part of what we pride ourselves on. And we do have some more comments here. We have Lisa who's, who's wondering. Um, how do the wines compare to some of the some past vintages? We've got uh, 18s um, in the 50 year old um, and the 100 year old, and the and the 19 vintage in the terroirs. Great, sure. Um, Andrew, do you want to go? I, I was going to ask you about the um, about the winemaking um, because everyone's been talking about vineyards, which of course is the is the uh, the back ground the the foundation of uh, you know these types of wines but of course uh, the winemaking is really important and you're a bit low key on that um, but uh, rather than going through all the wines maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about the winemaking of the 100 year old vines and and what your approach certainly um, the ripeness the optimum ripeness window for picking is is key to to these wines and with uh, a, an older vine that is well balanced and is is good at uh, withstanding the vagaries of a late summer, of a warm late summer, the opportunity to, to nail that is, you know, the window is actually opened a little bit longer by the very health of the vine. Um, and in fact, so we, we absolutely 
they have uh, priority uh, service in the in the vin in the winery. We keep a fermenter open for those so that we can get them on the day that they are best. And I'm in those vineyards very very regularly. Then we bring them in, um, and Shiraz in particular really likes a little bit of um, pre-fermentation time on skins, without the yeast growing or maybe a few little wild yeast starting their their journey. Uh, you know, I love seventy-two four days, 72 hours or, or four days of um, pre-fermentation maceration. The ferment will start to get going. Uh, uh, we really try and keep things nice and cool, um, preserving the fruit character. And at dryness, we'll take them off skins with a basket press. Um, we have a, a really awesome uh, Booker basket press, which we have the longest, slowest press cycles which on. Which was the first in Australia in its size. <clears throat> um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a nice bit of kit to, to have. We will press those. Um, some of the free run will go direct to barrel. Um, some will go to tank. And we, we love the, you know, the basket presses are so gentle that, um, you know, the, the later pressings, which can sometimes be lesser wine, in fact, are greater wines and they are really power essence wines. Yeah. Um, and, and then maturation is really, um, our oak style here is more of the sort of Bur Burgundy French Coopers. I'm, I'm a fan of, of Francois Frere in, in oh, me the 100-year-old. And, and I like to see that, that lifts that uh, fruit profile, but it yeah. also brings a, a little bit of smoky complexity to it. Yeah. And I found that um, in all these wines, Andrew, um, there's this wonderful underlying note of oak. You know, we're winemakers, we're not carpenters. And often we taste a lot of wines that are really have been a little bit too heavy on that. And I think what I love about the wines you're making, Neville, is just this under, under element of elegant wood, just adding to it, adding to that complexity. I must add to say, Andrew, we've also, um, next year we'll be releasing 150 year old Shiraz, of which again, there are about 10 hectares in the whole Barossa. So we're now talking 0.01%. We bought a very old vineyard uh, recently, 10 years ago, still giving me gray hairs, um, but it's been dry grown for 150 years. Just going up on that beautiful Eastern slope, yeah. the earth is mean up there. It's so mean. And yet these old girls have survived 150 years and I'm so proud of that because it's another string to our bow to and to everybody Andrew and to Michelle thank you so much Andrew is a very very special man uh, we will forgive him for going to Geelong gra uh, Grammar I've what? known <laughs> I, I've known him for a long while I, we also will forgive him that he has got such a wonderful vocabulary but Andrew is a great scribe and a great friend of wine and the master of wines, and that's not so easy to get. And when he got it, there were very few. How many when you were master of wine, Andrew? Out of Australia? Oh, I don't know. I think I was number four or five or something like that, yeah. And how many in the world at that stage? Very few. About, I don't know, about 230, 220, I can't remember. In the whole world. And Andrew provides what I love is he gives a dimension of consumer friendliness and can talk about a wine and he, wine, and he can personify a wine with me. And I try and do that. Um, it's, you know, it's another dimension. It's very, very rare. And Andrew's ability to write and wordsmith, we're just so happy. Um, Michelle, make Andrew sign the book at the day, uh, uh, the opening May of the cellar door um, <laughs> in the rocks. I'm Is so proud of that. All right. Guys, you've no idea how proud I am of that because it took us two years to get through and they're telling me we've got a couple of minutes left. Thank yeah. you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Very proud of you. Andrew, so much, thank you. Neville, of course, without you and without me. The place. Hey, all right. I've got all a better right, well, I'm going to close this tasting. <laughs> um, but I think uh, everyone who's been uh, tasting these wines would agree that uh, Shadow Tsunanda's uh, made a massive amount of headway um, over the last 10, 20 years. You know, I think the, the wines reflect the mood and character of the Barossa. I really like them. I think Neville's been, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the man with who's incredibly uh, humble and doesn't really shout out much about himself, but he's a very, very, very fine winemaker. And I love the way that uh, Shadow Tananda is, uh, is really exploring the sub-regional qualities of the Barossa, um, celebrating the story of uh, old vine stocks, uh, vines and vine stock material. 
And I think all of these things really neatly align with the history of, of, of Shadow Tananda, but also with its future. And I think it's really exciting, Michelle, that, uh, that you're the managing director and it's your task to take it really to the next phase. And as you guys know, Michelle, it's always good to remind our, 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 our fellow custodians and people who support that the name Tananda means where the two rivers meet. Our river in Yorm River and where the ducks drink on the pond, the old Aborigine, the Tanundi Creek and the Parra River, the Tananda. In America, we have to say it's not Chateau Tanunda from the Barossa, it's Chateau Tananda from Down Under. And they get okay, it. Right. But okay, um, we're very, very proud of that. Uh, never, uh, never miss <laughs> with that. And I, I think so where the two rivers meet, thank you everybody for our rivers thank meeting you. today. I'm so jealous that I'm not in Sydney at that cellar door. To get that through the Rocks Authority, Michelle, you know better than anybody. It's been a two year adventure, yeah, um, but we're there and we're very, very proud of it. Fantastic. Thank you so yeah. much, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Wonderful comments in the history. Yeah. And thanks guys in the process. Yeah. Hope we can all see you in person, everyone around the world and around Australia soon. Pro thanks wine, we're gonna be one of the only Australians there. <laughs> bye, bye bye, see you. Cheers. Thanks bye. so much, everybody. Cheers, bye. Great wines, Neville. I'm drinking the Cimelon now because uh, <laughs> it's, it's a great uh, it's a great cut through after all that red wine. Thank you so much. Cheers. Well done.